Welcome to Let the Quran Speak. I'm joined by Sadia Khan. She's a certified life coach and the founder of Strong Muslima Life Coach. Sadia, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. Thank you so much for inviting me. I want to talk to you, Sadia, today about the D word, you know, the word that nobody likes discussing, that is divorce. Um, you know, people have a sort of tendency to shy away from discussion of divorce or, you know, tuck it under the rug and forget about it. But divorce is a sad reality uh, amongst Muslims in North America and, and really anywhere in the world. Absolutely. So, and I understand, Sadia, that you yourself went through a divorce. I did. And you ended up coaching other Muslim women uh, as they went through the process of divorce themselves. So you have a lot to talk to us about. So I'm really excited that you're here. So Sadia, to begin, how would someone go through that process of getting a divorce? Let's say somebody thinks, OK, this is it. I can't do this anymore. What do they do? Um, well, there's multiple avenues depending on where you are geographically, but I think the first thing you would do is talk to your husband, right? Unless there's some kind of safety uh, issue, you would have to have that difficult conversation. You've tried everything and you truly have to feel like you tried everything, that you gave it your all. You went and got the therapy. You went and talked to family and community, uh, people in the community or people in your family, and you got that help you might have needed. And then you, of course, have to consult Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do your istikhara, feel at peace with your decision. And then you move forward. And that just depends on where you are. Mm -hmm. So what do you do to move forward? You know, I can imagine someone being very stressed and frustrated, you know, heading to their computer, of course, or mm -hmm. their phone, first of all, mm -hmm. and, and typing in some words, yeah. you know, something comes up. And I'm sure there'll be a, a dozen different search results. And then how do you go through all those pages and figure out what you yeah. need to do? I think, unfortunately, there really is a lack of support in the Muslim community um, when it comes to supporting women through this decision. Um, I still often hear about women going to their local imam or consulting a community leader and being told, no, no, you need to save the marriage at all costs. Or they're told, you know, you need to be patient or you need to put up with the abuse because the marriage and the children are more important. So I think the first thing is a woman needs to feel at peace with her decision and she needs to feel like it's the right one. Um, after that, unfortunately, the Muslim community still lacks a lot of resources when mm -hmm. it comes to what to do next. So you should absolutely consult a lawyer, right? Especially if you feel like this is going to be a uh, divorce that's going to be riddled with confrontation and um, financial uh, back and forth. Mm -hmm. But if it's amicable, and it often is, then a family mediator might be a better way to go. Mm -hmm. So someone would search online for, for a lawyer and I a think, family mediator? Yeah, I think almost everything is done online now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Sadia, what about if somebody is not financially independent? How mm -hmm. would they navigate a divorce? And what sort of considerations would they have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think I'm always surprised that women don't realize how much of their husband's money they're entitled to. Uh, if you've been home for a number of years and your husband's been the one out working, which is a lot of the women I talk to, um, that income does not belong completely to him. Mm -hmm. And that's not, and, and Islam doesn't teach us, teach us that, and Canadian culture doesn't teach us that either. You've been home and you've been providing a service. Mm -hmm. Although it looks like it's for free, it's not for free. You've given up your time, your energy, your um, career in many cases to watch the children, to uh, cook, to clean. And you're doing that in exchange for someone financially supporting you. But you've also given up something in, in exchange, you, and there's an opportunity cost involved there. So the, the income that your husband earns or the businesses he's involved in, you have access to some of that, not all of it. And that wouldn't be fair or right either. You have to do what's ethical. But you have access to some of it. And you have access to it moving forward, not just for a small moment in time, because mm -hmm. those are his children just as much as they're yours. So how do you access those resources? Yeah, so if you're going to be uh, following the Canadian system, right, and I, I guess most of your audience is Canadian, then I would say go to a lawyer first mm -hmm. and talk about everything, everything you can think of under the sun, disclose everything, and then the lawyer will be in the best position to be your advocate. What you need at this time is an advocate. Mm -hmm. And we don't usually find that advocacy, unfortunately, in our families and in our friends and in our communities. We need somebody who can objectively sort of look at our situation and tell us what to do next. Mm -hmm. Now, um, lawyers sometimes aren't the best, right? There's different types of lawyers. So one thing I advise my clients to do, and I've advised uh, women in the past, and something I did myself, 
is when I felt like my lawyer was too busy and wasn't necessarily advocating in my best interest, I went and booked a one hour consultation with an amazing lawyer, Mm -hmm. one that was way beyond something I could afford. Mm -hmm. And I asked her, can I record the conversation? And she said, yes. And I took notes and I picked her brain and I asked so many questions. And in that one hour, I developed a roadmap for the rest of my divorce. Mm -hmm. And I actually used that with my actual lawyer to devise strategies and to come up with tools for how to move forward because he seemed a little bit lost to me and I just didn't feel confident. And I also didn't know what I was doing, obviously. Mm -hmm. So if if someone is in a situation where, you know, the house seems very toxic, like a toxic environment, Mm -hmm. should they leave the marital home? Yeah, I know that the Quran advises us to stay, especially during the period of Idda. But if there's any kind of safety concern, then I don't think that advice applies. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of times uh, there are safety concerns, absolutely, Mm -hmm. not just in terms of potential physical abuse, but uh, a lot of men, when they're the ones being left, um, even the most gracious men, uh, there's a lot of anger involved and they can, they might respond by being controlling or trying to, um, you know, suddenly curtail activities that were considered quite normal a few months before. um, And that constant toxic energy isn't good for you, isn't good for him, isn't good for the children, certainly. Mm -hmm. So it might be in your best interest. And of course, it depends on the individual situation, but it might be in the best interest to to leave the marital home. Mm -hmm. So Adia, what happens if, you know, your family, your friends are not supportive or not understanding of what you're going through as you go through this divorce? Yeah, I mean, they're usually not. That's (laughs) one thing you have to be prepared for. We still have so much stigma around divorce. So uh, a lot of our parents, they're very well-intentioned and they want the best for us. And they have their own cultural scripts that they follow. So even though they know that this is allowed in Islam, they aren't going to be very encouraging. Mm. And they're going to, in nine times out of ten, they're going to tell you to stay in the marriage and make it work at all costs. Mm -hmm. Which, if you've been doing for a couple of years, isn't very helpful advice. So you kind of have to have that internal confidence and you have to connect with supportive people. And Allah will provide from sources you could not have imagined, mm-hmm. right, to help you connect. And that's not just money. That's also the provision of support mm-hmm. in other people. And um, you are going to have to rely maybe on yourself more than you're used to as well and to, mm-hmm. and to your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm-hmm. I imagine that, you know, the old support networks and all the connections that you had, mm-hmm. some of them might be ruptured. And you might oh, have yeah. to form completely new relationships. Yeah, it's it's divorce is not just the death of a marriage; it's the death of your old identity and so many of your old, so much of your old community as well. Um, there's people you would definitely not expect that would be in your corner, and then there's people you would not expect that would be completely against it. Mm-hmm. And you have to be understanding to those people as well, because just like you took a couple of years to grieve the end of the relationship they are now reeling from the shock and they're going to take time to grieve the end of the relationship. And it might be best to distance yourself from those people for a while because their advice is going to feel um, like judgmental or toxic or, or not very understanding. Um, so, And women do that. And by the way, some of those relationships recover mm-hmm. later on. And the person, when they see your confidence and your peace, they're like, oh, you know what, you did the right thing. I'm sorry I wasn't there for you. Mm -hmm. But sometimes a relationship never recovers. And that's one of the most shocking aspects of divorce is sometimes you lose your closest friends. Sometimes your relationship with particular family members is never the same again. But that's okay. Like if something brings you closer to Allah, in the end, it was good for you. Mm -hmm. Right? So sometimes letting go is letting go of layers of our identity and letting go of our dependence on other people as well. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about children, because yes. that's what everybody thinks about, you know. Yeah. Whenever people think about divorce and the outcome of divorce and, you know, the sort of suffering that goes through goes with it, they often think about children and yeah. what they're going to experience. Mm-hmm. What advice do you give people when it comes to thinking about children? Is it better to stay in a relationship? Is it better to leave? Mm-hmm. How do you navigate? How do you help your children navigate through the process of divorce? Yeah, I mean, divorce is hard on its own, but with children, it's infinitely more difficult and complex. And I hear women every single week tell me, I would have left a long time ago, but I don't want to because of the kids, Mm -hmm. right? And so 
Yes, it's difficult. One of the things we want to do is give our kids the best possible experience in life. I think we're all motivated as mothers to do that. But shielding them from every possible pain or problem is actually not good for their development. Mm -hmm. So if we pivot to the sort of framework where we're like, children are resilient. And if my child sees me dealing with this in a positive, constructive way, I've now modeled resilience for my child. They now have that blueprint for the rest of their life. You also want to ask yourself, do I want my child to end up in a marriage like the one I'm in? Because they will. Mm -hmm. the, your, your actions speak way louder than your words, right? So if your husband or ex-husband isn't exactly how you want your sons to turn out, you, you're in a position to legitimately question that marriage. If you yourself are not the type of uh, wife you want your daughter to eventually be, then you have to you ask yourself, is this a good situation I've put my children in? Maybe the toxicity is staying in a marriage like that, mm -hmm. right? And of course, this is what you have to try everything to save the marriage for the sake of Allah. And this is after, you know, tapping into every possible support to fix the marriage. And, and when you're finally ready to say this cannot be fixed, right? What do I do next? Is the only thing holding me in this marriage my children? And am I really serving them in their long-term interests by keeping uh, myself stuck in this situation? Because children absorb energy. Um, I can tell you that as a teacher, like however I start the first 20 seconds of a lesson is how that lesson's going to go. Mm. So of course you're, you're at home and you're exuding a certain energy. Your children will pick up on that. If you're not happy and fulfilled and, and feeling peaceful and content in your life, that's going to show up in your children one way or another. Mm -hmm. Sadia, is there sort of peace and contentment that a person finds after a while? Like, you know, when you go through a divorce, it's very tumultuous. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. It's frustrating. It's stressful. And then is there a period where everything becomes, you know, peaceful and happy and, and you feel like you're moving forward in a different way in your life? You, you kind of overcome all those fears and stresses. I mean, you've gone through a divorce yeah. yourself. Maybe you can speak from your personal experience or from the experience of speaking with other women. Yeah, I, I did have that. Um, I think for a lot of women, the period of um, chaos and internal conflict is actually leading up to the decision. Mm -hmm. And I've heard so many women say, once I was able to finally make that decision, I felt a sense of relief. But... Um, I think what helps is feeling like you can stand in front of a, uh, God on the day of judgment and say, I tried everything. Mm -hmm. Like I really threw myself into this to make it work and it still didn't work. Right. So that's number one, feeling like you did exhaust every possible option. Um, and secondly, to feel like you connected to God through the experience, not away from God. Mm -hmm. And there are signs of that. Right. Mm -hmm. If you're getting up to pray and you're reciting Quran and you're remembering Allah and you're making dua. That's a sign that you are closer to God through this experience. But if you're starting to do other things um, that are away from uh, the religion and away from, you know, what, what feels peaceful, mm -hmm. then you've possibly, you know, gone in a different direction mm -hmm. that isn't the right direction for you. And that could be shaitan. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at your own actions and, and that will help you also make sense and make peace of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I ask you that question because yeah. sometimes people think, well, often it's said, yeah. you, know, you know, your life is going to be worse after you get divorced. You, yeah. know, you think that you're going into a better situation, yeah. but it's just going to be a lot more difficult. Yeah, temporarily, that's absolutely true mm -hmm. for everybody. Even people who leave and are absolutely certain that leaving was the right thing to do, they go through a period of grief and mm -hmm. they question whether or not that was the right decision, even after doing istikhara. And those moments of self-doubt are in all of us and we're even in the prophets uh, after making important and difficult decisions, right? But um, if you keep your connection to God and you stay patient, I think there is a moment of relief and clarity that finally comes for most people. Mm -hmm. That's what I've seen anyways. I ran a divorce support group for years, uh, and now I coach clients through this process. And I do see that moment um, of calm and clarity come, mm -hmm. whether it's a few weeks down the road or a few months down the road. For some people, it takes a little bit longer. There is a moment where they're like, no, I did everything I could and this was the right decision for myself and for my children. So, you know, being patient and understanding that it's a grieving process, just like any other grieving process that you would go through. Mm -hmm. um, you have to give yourself time and you have to give yourself love and nourishment as you work through the stages of it.
Sadia, thank you for the work that you do. I mean, it's much needed in the Muslim community, so I'm yes. glad that you're one of the individuals doing it. Thank and you thank so you for joining us on the show and no, sharing I your insights. I loved being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're welcome. On behalf of Let the Quran Speak, I want to say thank you. You've helped us become the most widely watched Muslim TV show in Canada. I want to appeal to you to continue to support us. You can visit our website, QuranSpeaks.com. We also accept e-transfers to iGive at QuranSpeaks.com. And we're now on Patreon, so you can make a monthly contribution. May God bless you and your loved ones today and always.